Hey everybody, this is John Buck back with another array signal processing video. Uh, in this video, I'm going to talk about the sample matrix inversion uh, version of the minimum variance distortionless response beamformer. And this is the practical algorithm we often have to deploy because in the real life situation, we don't actually know the covariance matrix, the spatial covariance matrix ideally. And so we have to estimate it from data and then use that data to find the array weights we're going to use. Uh, to make our adaptive beamformer. So we're going to talk about, in this, this video, we're just going to talk about uh, how that works, how we set that up. Uh, in, some of the, in class tomorrow and some of the later videos, we'll talk about measuring the performance and how that uh, performance depends on how much data we can average into this sample covariance matrix. Okay, so let's switch over to the whiteboard. So for the MVDR beamformer, right, we've seen the array weights are uh, the gain alpha times S and the spatial covariance matrix and the inverse times V naught, where this uh, the V naught is the uh, manifold vector for the steering direction or the replica vector. So then for the look direction or the steering direction, right? And so, and this uh, the spatial covariance matrix, right, is the expected value of x x Hermitian, the outer product of that. And then again, this alpha is just what we need to get the unity gain uh, value here. Right, and this is great in practice, but, but what, what's difficult here is this is a theoretical thing, right? To compute an expected value, I need to know the PDF of the actual data. And I may not know that. If I don't know where the interferers are or how loud they are, I won't know that. Uh, so in practice, we often have to estimate that. In practice, we estimate, say it, we'll call it Sn hat from capital K snapshots, where those are measurements of the array data. So x sub 1, x sub 2, up to x sub k. So just to write that out clearly, they'd set what we, this is what we call the sample covariance matrix. So S hat of n will be 1 over k times the sum, we'll use a little l to keep it clear from wave number, from one to total number of snapshots of x of l times its outer product. Right, so the same function. I'm just averaging the function here that that I would that uh, that I, I wish I had, but I don't. And again, this is theoretical. And the other thing I I should have reminded us right is this is the for MVDR. This is the signal absent version. Right, so this is assuming we can collect a bunch of data without the signal being present, uh, and then start processing data when the signal arrives. Uh, and, and in different scenarios, that's easier or, or more challenge. Sometimes that's easier, sometimes it's more challenging. But, uh, and again, this is this version here is often called the sample covariance matrix. And so what we do is, is we, to, to, to run our beamform in practice, we compute this or we update this on the fly from our data. We keep sort of a running average. And then we plug this in, this estimate in, for the truth up here. So let me get a new page and we'll do that. So this is, uh, in the, the book and, and in various references, is often called sample matrix inversion. Or SMI MBDR. So to make it clear where the distinction is important, the difference between the theoretical version, if I knew the true covariance matrix, and then what I have to do in practice is I now say, well, to make it clear, these, these are going to give us different array weights. I'll have a W hat uh, that will be based on, uh, we can call it alpha hat too, just to make sure I make it explicit, many of these things have changed. And then I'll have the inverse of the estimated matrix. The only thing that hasn't changed is the replica vector, right? So this, where, where, you know, just to be clear, Sn hat inverse would be, normally we would compute 
s hat of n, like we did on the previous page, and then take the inverse of that matrix, and then alpha hat is, is basically the same functional form. We're just plugging this in. The s hat in for all the others, right? So that's the the sample matrix inversion form. And in principle, this seems like a good thing because the, the, the matrix has some good properties. There's some helpful properties, so let's set those up. So the first of those is that the sample covariance matrix is what we call an asymptotically consistent estimator. And what that means is that as I get more and more snapshots into that average, right, so as that capital K goes to infinity, the estimated covariance matrix will converge to the true one. Right, so in the limit, if I have enough data, it will be very accurate. In real life, the challenge is, can I get enough data without the world changing? Another important property is that a maximum likelihood property. So if the signal and noise are Gaussian, we can actually show that the sample covariance matrix is the maximum likelihood estimate of the true covariance matrix for a given set of k snapshots, that this is, is the maximum likelihood version. Another important, uh, I guess less of a property, more piece of terminology, is that uh, if, we, if we bring the normalization back out front, there's, there's a name for this in the statistics letter. This is a complex Wishart matrix. And so there are a lot of useful results from the statistics literature and more recently about random matrix theory that hopefully we'll get to talk about next week or maybe the week after uh, about properties of the eigenvalues of such matrices uh, and how those those vary as a function of the, the ratio of sensors to snapshots. But this what this is important is this parameterizes on the ratio of the snapshots k to the sensors capital N. So that's another one. And then uh, the, the last thing, again, to make this distinction is in real life when we are collecting data, we may not have the luxury of a signal absent collection. We may be collecting data where the signal of interest is present also. Uh, and so Van Trees makes a distinction between that. We can think of that in our, our hypothesis testing frame, right? In H0, in H0, we may have a, a sum of a bunch of interferers, V1 through VD, plus background noise, but there's no signal, right? The signal is absent. And so the notation Van Trees would use is, is, again, that we have S hat of N, like we were using above. This is the estimate of this data. On the other hand, with H1, when we have H1, this is the version that has all those interferers and noise plus the signal of interest present. And when we do that, uh, Van Trees would, would make a distinction. He, he often calls this S sub X to remind us the signal is present too. So we have you know, signal plus interferers in this case. And, and depending on the problem we're working on, interfere, interferers, and noise. Depending on the problem we're working on, we may not have a choice. We may only get data that has, we may not be able to avoid this or get sort of signal absent noise only data. Uh, and Ventries has his own notation. He is kind of picky. He calls this this version the MVDR because this was Capon's original assumption. And 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 Ventries calls this version the minimum power distortionless response. Or, or MPDR. But just as, as warning, you know, the, the Van Trees book uses this. Some people use this notation. Other people may not be that picky about it, and they sometimes use MBDR to cover both of these cases. So if it's important, you may need to clarify with the people you're talking to. You're talking about uh, the case where your, your sample covariance matrix potentially includes the signal of interest, at least in some snapshots or not. And, and let me uh, finish up. I'll, I'll show a slide um, showing where we get into an issue with this, which is is uh, depending on the amount of um, 
snapshots we have, uh, the inverse of the sample covariance matrix may not be as well behaved as the true ensemble version. So this is a, a, a view graph from a talk, which again is showing the, the, the risk of using the uh, sample covariance instead of the ensemble, where uh, what I have here is this is an example of a 50 element array where I've got one loud interferer and then a background white noise. So this is the true ensemble where all the, the noise should have the same variance. And then this is what I get if I estimate the sample covariance matrix and look at its eigenvalues when I have uh, the number of snapshots here, I, I wrote L instead of K, but what we were calling capital K a second ago, is two times the number of sensors. I still have a nice loud eigenvalue here, but what's going on is I've got uh, a complicated thing. Is the, the red dashed line is the ideal eigenvalue, and we can see that even when I have uh, twice as many snapshots as sensors to average in this, I get a widespread of eigenvalues, and some of these are very small, and what's going to be a problem is, is that when I take this matrix inverse of this sample covariance matrix, the estimated one, these very small things are going to get very large, and that's going to result lots of noise gain. It's going to, to increase the magnitude of W squared in many cases. And so by having those small eigenvalues get inverted, uh, I have a lot of numerical issues. And so pr practical beamformers, adaptive beamformers, are often specifically worrying about how to maintain that or how to keep uh, the small eigenvalues from getting too large. All right, so I'm going to stop this video here. Again, the main point is this idea that in real life we don't know the ensemble covariance matrix, and so we often have to estimate it from data using the sample covariance matrix and the terminology frequently used for that version where we, we use that estimated covariance matrix instead of the true one is called sample matrix inversion, or SMI, for the adaptive beamform. Okay, so that I'll stop here, and I'll see you next time.